subscribe to our YouTube channel and press the bell icon to get the latest updates. Many of you keep writing to me that oil price hike is the biggest issue in your mind. That every day you wake up worrying about this and the prices of oil keep going up. And why am I not talking about it? So we take what you say very seriously. So I will talk about oil price hike today and tell you about some complexities and some issues there. But it is not the oil that you mostly talk about. You usually talk about, you usually talk about oil that is petrol as in the gas that you put in your vehicles or LPG or kerosene or diesel again that you put in your vehicles, tractors, uh, generators, etc. I am not talking about that oil. I am talking today instead about the other oil and the other oil is the oil without which our kitchens will come to a standstill. This is not the oil crude oil that goes into making our LPG. This is the oil that goes into our kadhais, frying pans, tawas, whatever we decide to cook our goose in. Sorry for that sad, sad metaphor. But everything you cook needs oil. Every meal needs oil, edible oil. Edible oil is also an essential need for our bodies, human bodies, much as everybody tells us to eat less oil. But that lecture or that sermon only goes out to those who have enough to buy oil and who might be eating too much oil. But a lot of people in India can't afford oil. But without edible oil, that is ghee, tail, whatever you call it, banaspati, normal human beings can't survive and oil prices have been rising. In fact, they've been rising so much that in one month, that is the month of May this year, Government of India figures showed that prices of some edible oils saw 30% inflation. That is the highest ever in history. Now, this is a price rise that is hurting every kitchen in India. And we are a nutcase country, I'm sorry to say that, that every time the price of onions goes up, it's, it's a seasonal phenomenon. Just before a new crop comes in, before that at the tail end of the tail end of the leftover stocks from the last crop, onion prices go up and everybody goes ballistic or apocalyptic or apoplectic or whatever. All TV channels, housewife is crying tears of tears of sorrow, onion has gone up this much. It's a seasonal increase for a couple of months. And then you have stories of the bust for farmers. So when onion prices go, goes up, governments open imports, block exports, so farmers can't make money when the prices go up. When onion crop comes and there's a crash in prices, government does nothing. So you have farmers throwing their onion stocks on the highways in frustration. So onions get us so exercised, the middle class, particularly the consuming middle classes, that all of the media gets focused on that. Edible oil, in, on the other hand, it is affecting everybody in the middle class, everybody in the upper crust. Okay, upper crust doesn't probably even know the price they pay for their oil. Or maybe many of them are sort of like uh, exotic oil consuming classes. Many of them have moved on to um, moved on to olive oil or avocado oil and stuff like that. But forget them. All of the middle class, but also the poor class, the poorest of the poor are affected by the rise in the prices of edible oil. And India's edible oil prices have been rising. That's because global edible oil prices are rising. I will give you some data on that. Because of that, household budgets across Indian society, but particularly among the poor and lower middle classes, are now deeply stressed. But that is not something we talk about because for a lot of us in the media, particularly the TV channels, there isn't this insufficient sex appeal because this is not something, this is not a political commodity as yet. Unfortunately, it should be a political commodity. It's not a political commodity as yet, like say, onions. Because once party lost an election, apparently because of onion price in Delhi, that was the BJP. And since then, onions have become a fashionable sex appeal story and everybody latches on to it. Also, Edible oil prices is a story with many complexities. It's a story with many complexities and it's also a perpetual story. It goes on and on and on and on. And it started in some ways after the economic reform of 1991. Now you might say, ha, ah, if you don't like economic reform and you are one of those old socialists, you will think that maybe something awful was done because of economic reform that caused this problem. No, what happened with economic reform was quality of life went up people's incomes went up 
and as incomes went up people started consuming more oil because oil is expensive so people need to have their roti uh, their chawal right or dal if they can afford it a little bit of dahi if if they if they if, if they if if they can afford it or a little bit of vegetables then you move up the value chain maybe some eggs some meats but oil oil you limit in terms of what you can afford so as incomes went up india's demand for edible oils went up and as the demand went up domestic production was unable to keep pace with it and as that happened the gap between india's need and domestic production kept on rising and today you have a situation when india consumes 25 million tons that is 2 and a half crore tons of edible oils every year and only 10 and a half million tons is produced domestically that means 14.5 million tons is imported from outside that's a lot of edible oil india is the largest edible oil importer in the world by value i think last year's amount of money spent on edible oil imports was upwards of 10 billion dollars almost 11 billion dollars i think this year it will be more than 11 billion dollars because now the prices have also gone up of course uh, the crude oil imported by india is upwards of 100 billion dollars but this also is nearly 11 billion dollars for the oil that we in which we fry our samosas or we fry our jalebis or we fry our parathas or we do our tadka etc etc now because we import so much we are very dependent on global edible oil prices so we are we are sort of held to ransom by the global commodities market on this one look at the basket of our imports and basket of our consumption so i have a lot of this data from samyak pandey who covers agriculture and commodities for us i also have some from readings here and there particularly from the indian express so i'll share with you an article that harish damodran who's among the finest uh, writers on agriculture in india that he has written on edible oils and also an editorial from the paper uh, which i will share with you now a lot of this discussion has actually been sparked by government of india's new plan new scheme to promote the growing of more palm oil in india that became the trigger we are a very strange country anything that hits the real poor we don't care about particularly in the media and definitely not in the tv media because the poor don't account for trps it's the middle class that accounts for trps and for the, for the middle class onions are an issue petrol diesel are an issue but for some reason edible oils are not an issue although every every middle class family would spend more money on edible oil every month than on onions but why this happens don't ask me but that is the truth the fact is that government of india politically reacted to a challenge the challenge was that india was short of edible oils a lot of imports were taking place the bulk of these imports are of an oil called palm oil now if you see india's total import of about 14.5 million tons every year of that 60 to 70% is palm oil now palm oil where does it grow you look at the us uh, department of agriculture data that tells you quite clearly that much of palm oil grows in southeast asia in fact a lot of the palm oil grows in one country which is uh, which is indonesia so indonesia grows about 45% of all of the world's palm oil malaysia grows about 20% of all of the world's palm oil Mal thailand has about 3% and a few other countries nigeria honduras and others they are all in the ballpark of about 1% each so not very much India grows some palm oil but not that much the bulk of it is imported so India imports 14.5 billion tons of edible oil per year of which 60 to 70% is palm oil in fact just as government of india makes money by putting tax on crude oil and petroleum products it also earns a lot of money by taxing edible oil imports and the tax is quite sizable 30 to 40% so much so that last year government of india earned 30000 crore rupees on import duty while our total imports were about 75000 crore rupees converted from dollar to rupee now this will go up this will go up and oil prices have gone up so it looks like 
now this bill will go up to lakh and 30000 crore rupees this year and government of india's earnings from just duty on this customs duty on this will go up to 40 45000 crores that's after government of india in some panic reacting to this market pressure has cut some duties especially on palm oil because they know that palm oil is also consumed by the poorest of India and lower middle classes. Palm oil also goes into making what is vanaspati or what the, in the old fashioned language is called dalda. If you might remember the old containers of dalda or even rath or any of these vanaspatis as they were called, these are hydro hydrogenated oils, they were mostly uh, made from palm oil. So those containers, those round uh, canisters they had pictures of oil palms on them so sometimes as children also we used to wonder that you know oil comes from groundnut it comes from mustard it comes from cows and uh, buffaloes if it's ghee but why do they put these big trees right so those are palm trees and at, until then there was no palm trees in india this was all imported now see what's happened to global prices of palm oil if you look at palm oil Palm oil is basically, because Malaysia, Indonesia are such big producers, one large segment of futures trading in palm oil is something that's called Barsa Malaysia derivatives. Now, Barsha, Barsa Malaysia derivatives on this 25th of May were selling at 69,547 rupees per ton. I'm rounding out the figures, not putting pesas there. 69,547 rupees per ton. On 25th of May 2020, exactly a year back, this was 40,781. So in one year, this has gone up more than 60%. It's a big increase in palm oil prices. If you look at Chicago Board of Trade, where a lot of food commodities uh, are traded and futures are traded, you will find the July, July delivery for soybean oil compared to May 24 was about twice as much from 22,752 rupees to 41,580 rupees. Palm oil in June from compared to June 2020. In June 2020, palm oil in India was selling for 86 rupees a kilo. It's now selling for 138 rupees a kilo. So see how much it has increased in palm oil is the cheapest oil bulk of the oil eaten by us Indians. In fact, this price and this level of price increase percentage price increase is the highest in 11 years. In fact, if you look at government of India's data in May, the edible oil inflation is 30.8%. It's not just double digits. It's double digits multiplied by three and leave a, a few decimal points. 30.8%, it's the highest ever inflation in edible oil prices. Now, everything has gone up. Groundnut, mustard, vanaspati, soya, sunflower oil, palm oil, everything, everything has gone up. Now, what is the reason why it's gone up? So, one reason is there is labor shortage in Malaysia. Now, palm oil has, a big, has big plantations in Malaysia. So, people have to come, labor has to come from other parts of the world to come and work there, obviously from poorer parts of the world. Last year, because of the pandemic and then the return of the pandemic, a lot of people have not been able to come. So, there's been labor shortage in Malaysia that has suppressed production. Number two, weather, weather conditions have not been very good. Uh, you know that uh, we, we are seeing impact of climate change quite, quite rapidly now and some of that has affected uh, oil palm production. Number three, in Indonesia, something else has happened. In the Indonesia, while the weather is an issue, but also Indonesia has now made a big switch to biofuels. So now in Indonesia, under law, for every bit of fossil fuel that you have, you have 70% fossil fuel that is from that, that you take from crude oil, but 30% has come from bi biofuel, which is palm oil. So a lot of palm oil is now being directed towards fuel in, in, fuel in Indonesia. And that is causing a shortage of palm oil supplies in the world. Then see what has happened everywhere. It's a perfect storm. Soybean oil. India, unfortunately, was growing quite nicely with soybean and then India lost its way because unlike the more, most progressive countries in the world and unlike most big soybean growing powers in the world, India has still 
put its head in the sand and refuse to embrace genetically modified soybean seed. So Indian soybean can't compete in prices and productivity uh, with what's coming from these big countries in Southern America. So soybean, there's been a drought in Argentina this year. Uh, for sunflower, there's been a drought in Ukraine and Russia from where we import most of these oils. In fact, if you look at the figures, Samyak tells me, then 85% of our, of our soybean oil import are from Argentina and Brazil. And 90% of our sunflower oil import are from Russia and Ukraine. All of these have had drought this year. That's the reason I said it's a perfect storm. Now, in India, you might say, why can't we increase our production? So we are actually increasing our production. So last year, Kharif crop, the area under oil seeds went up uh, quite a bit by 18 lakh hectares or 10%. It's a lot. 10% is a lot of area in India. 18 lakh hectares, right? Again, <clears throat> and, and, and the Kharif crop, the summer crop is mostly groundnut and soybean. So groundnut went up by 30%, Mufali, soybean went up by 7%. Rabi crop, that is 2021, because Rabi crop is the winter crop, uh, oil seeds went up by 4%. Rabi crop, oil, the dominant oil seed in the Rabi crop is mustard, right? Then went up, that went up by 4%. And yet, this was not enough because production went up substantially, but the gap was still too much because as we know, our population is increasing and our incomes have been increasing, not lately, but they have been increasing. So oil consumption, oil demand in India is increasing. So that is the reason that government has now come up with this new oil palm plan. This is a national mission. It's called NMEO hyphen op that is national mission on edible oil hyphen oil palms now what this what this entails is that government will spend 11000 crores to incentivize people to increase area under oil palms because no matter what you do unless we increase more oil palm production we cannot make up for our shortage of oil because you can't say that let's grow more groundnut let's grow more sunflower let's grow more mustard so for a population like India needs palm oil, whether you import it or you grow it domestically, that is a choice that you have to make. So this time the choice has been made that in, until by 2025, India has to increase greatly uh, its area under oil palms. And that is, that is where this incentive will go in. This will be uh, production linked, productivity linked, and there are lots of other things. I'm sharing a link for the entire plan video. You can see that. You will see the cover on the uh, on the screen. But please see that. I and I do think, and this is opinion. I do think it's a good plan. Now I know a lot of people have said that this will be very destructive of the environment. I will come to that point also. But if you see India's oil shortfall and the how overweight palm oil is, how much cheaper palm, palm oil is than the rest, how much more oil palms can produce by way of your oil demand in one hectare compared to the others. It's almost, it's almost 10 times, in fact, 10 to 12 times as much. So it is indispensable. Now, current area under oil palms in India, mostly in Andhra, Karnataka, little bit in Tamil Nadu, uh, the area right now is 3.5 lakh hectares. This new plan is targeting increasing this area by 25-26 to 10 lakh hectares. And consumption right now, I told you, all the edible oils in India is 25 million tons. It's estimated that by 25-26, it will be 29 million tons. So India will need a lot more oil and a lot more palm oil by then. So I know the environmental issues, uh, palm oil is a polarizing crop because in Indonesia, in Malaysia, large, in large areas, lush forests, in some cases rainforests have been cut, entire, entire islands have been denuded from the original forests and palm oil has been planted. Now we know that oil palms are monoculture, that means only where you grow oil palms, only oil palm will grow. But the fact is, all agriculture is monoculture. Paddy is monoculture. Wheat is monoculture. Uh, millets, uh, these days, uh, very sexy. Monoculture. Every crop, mustard is monoculture. Because when you do agriculture, nothing else grows there except stuff like weeds that you want to kill. Uh, so, if you can grow 
other oil seeds, you can also grow palm oil as oil seeds. It's just that you should not do it by cutting any forest. So I see an idea that maybe some islands in Andaman, Nicobar, etc. can be used for palm oil cultivation. I hope that doesn't happen. Because also cultivating palm oil is very complicated because oil comes out very quickly. You have to have a processing plant and refinery right there. All that to set up in those islands is going to be nearly impossible. But when I read the plan carefully, when I read the scheme carefully, the emphasis on the northeastern states and Andaman Nicobar is very marginal and is very little. It's almost like an afterthought. For some reason, this has become the headline point. A lot of people have run with it because oil palm cultivation is a very politicized and very polarizing point, particularly in the environmental debate across the world. Now, if you see the states in which area is targeted to be increased, that is, uh, and, I, and these are states listed mostly in alphabetical order, that is Andhra Pradesh, Chhattisgarh, Goa, Gujarat, Karnataka, Kerala, Mizoram, Northeast, Odisha, Tamil Nadu, etc, etc. But if you look at the area targeted by way of increase, then bulk of the area comes from Andhra, Karnataka and Gujarat. So Andhra with 4 lakh hectares additional is almost 50% of all of the additional area planned in India. And farmers in Andhra, particularly in coastal Andhra, have already learned to grow uh, oil palms. In fact, they are very smart. They've also figured that oil palm takes five years maturing and yielding the first crop. So they've also figured that they can do some intercropping. They grow some other crops like cocoa meanwhile. Uh, and similarly, Karnataka, that is two and a half like the hectares, that is 30% of all of the additional increase planned. And there is Gujarat, there are about 60,000. The rest are very small. In fact, even if I look at Mizoram, Tripura, they are very, very, very small area. So it's not as if there is a target now to fill up all of the Northeast and all of the Andaman and Nicobar Islands with oil palms. Of course, if you are watching those BBC documentaries and CNN documentaries, they are all about how Indonesia and Malaysia have wiped out so much of their environment, so much of their forest area with oil palms. And when you see that, it looks very dire. But when you look at this plan, that does not seem to be the prospect in India. I do hope, however, that nothing of this will go to the Andaman and Nicobar Islands. Now, the other thing some of you have complained about is that you were expecting that I will speak about cricket a little bit. If nothing else, some highlights, particularly after the Oval win. I told you after Lords that I am superstitious and I think that if I you start celebrating too early, things go wrong. And I carry the scar of the 2014 series when the first match was drawn. Second was at Lords, India won and we thought we were doing very well. And then we lost the next three, uh, two of which were lost by an inning. So as a cricket partisan, I did not want to take any chances. But now that Oval has happened, I will talk not so much about that match or the match that, that begins now. The last test, because we don't know whether we'll win this series or not, because either this a test has to be a draw or India have to win. But India can't lose the series right now. We are 2-1 we are up. But a very interesting new phenomenon has risen in Indian cricket. And that phenomenon, my young colleague Nikhil Rampal, who is a fine data journalist, he's taken note of. And Nikhil Rampal knows nothing about cricket. If you ask him, off stump, leg stump, round the wicket, over the wicket, usko kuch pata nahi hai. But he knows data, right? What he knows about data, it will take me years understanding. So he's looked at 50, 60 years data. And he's told us in this story, and I'm sharing a link with you, and a couple of graphics will run uh, on my screen as we talk. And you are cricket coaches, all of you. We are a country of 1.38 billion cricket coaches. You will understand what these graphics are saying. The fact is, the balance of power in Indian cricket has shifted because Indian cricket is no longer led by batting stars. In fact, if anything, batting is today quite weak, particularly uh, the first five. Uh, Indian cricket is no longer led by its spin quartets or spin uh, trios and stuff like that. It is now led by this magnificent pace battery, which I call a marauding pace cavalry. So look at the six pace bowlers that you have. They are all interchangeable. And now you can always field four touchwood fit fast bowlers. And they are fast bowlers. They're really fast. And for evidence, look at just one data point. The 2011-21 is the first decade in India's cricket history 
when fast bowlers have taken more wickets that is 922 than spinners that is 877 now obviously you will say that oh we must have played more overseas because when you play more overseas fast bowlers will take more wickets so once again in these 10 years india have played 108 test matches exactly evenly divided we didn't plan it that's how the data is until the oval test 54 overseas 54 at home and what you think is correct pacers get more wickets overseas so over overseas test matches of the total wickets taken pacers have taken 618 and spinners have taken 204 right so you can see the pacers have taken more than thrice as many as spinners similarly in domestic matches spinners have taken 673 pacers have taken 204 but you, when you add both up 877 to spinners 922 to pacers now it is because of this the rise of this pace strength that india is doing much better overseas we won two series in australia and we are doing very well in this series in england so see also the data for the earlier decades, that is the decade of the 70s, that's when you had Karsan Ghabri, Madan Lal, Kapil Dev came towards the end, the decade of the 80s, Kapil Dev, Madan Lal, Roger Bini, then came Shri, uh, Srinath, Javagal Srinath and Venkatesh Prasad and Ajit Agarkar and Ashish Nehra and Ishan Sharma has always been there. So 90s, then the first decade of 2000s in each of the, those decades you find the number of wickets taken by pacemen going up but spinners have always stayed ahead this is the first decade where spinners have been left behind by pacers and that also explains the big shift in the fortune of indian cricket and big shift in the global balance of power in cricket you, you might ask me, why, am, why are we not looking at the period before 71? Because before 71, after partition, India hardly ever had any pacemen. Uh, there was Datu Fadkar, there was for some time Ramakan Desai, there was Shubrato Goha, I don't know how many people might remember him, right, uh, remember him at this point. But very few Indians who could be even called medium pacers in those periods and you had situations where Nawab of Patodi would come and roll over his arm and bowl a couple of overs and people will roll the ball back to get the ball quickly worn so spinners could come on or Sunil Gavaskar would open the attack anybody would be called in to open the attack so from that on Indian cricket has now changed fundamentally this data is telling you that as are the results